blah, 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 information and information and information. Something is like, oh, I keep thinking about that over and over again. And so pay attention to your own reactions to this content as well and to your own kind of like internal state. Don't just get lost in kind of like hearing content or listening like you're in school. But yeah, be in tune with yourself and how you're reacting and what you're trying to learn. Also, I'm getting warm on this myself. Um, and with your own goals as well. So, starting with the introduction to restoration. I'm gonna start back in this midway position, my favorite diagram, <laughs> apparently. Oh. So yeah, human beings, as we've talked about, are in this position where internally we're stuck in a place in between these desires of selfishness and selfish, selflessness, which is also kind of putting yourself in a position between God and Satan. And we also are kind of, you can almost say claimed by God and Satan as well, because God as the creator wants every person to be his child, right? He created us to be a certain way and do a certain thing. But Satan also inserted himself into our lineage. He put these fallen natures into human beings and puts this claim on human beings as well, saying like, no, I tainted them, so they're also partially mine. And so that we're stuck here with like these two great forces pulling on us internally all the time, all the time. But you do notice some people naturally have this tendency to be more good or more selfless or more kind and other people have more of a tendency to be kind of more selfish or kind of nasty or grumpy or anything like that. Why, why, why does it seem like not all people are equal in their positioning between God and Satan? The from something called the condition, which I tried to define as the actions you take that show whether your character is more like God's or more like Satan's. Because if you think about a person's character and how they act, it really shows their internal state, right? A person who is like really good and selfless, if you see someone carrying something really heavy and it seems like they need help, and your natural instinct would be like, oh, let me go help you. Let me do something about that. But other people, like someone's just carrying something like, wow, must be, must, must, must be tough. And don't really do much about it. I know for myself, like, it's not my first instinct to help people. And it's something I always try to work on. But like, yeah, when someone's carrying something or doing something, I notice others always rush in to help. And I'm like, kind of, it takes me a second. Like, oh yeah, he needs help. Oh shoot, I should help. <laughs> But doing those conditions, actually putting yourself in a position where you're practicing doing the thing that God would do, doing the good thing, doing the right thing, will make it more part of your character and more part of your, what you naturally do. While doing the things that take you away from selflessness, take you away from God, doing bad habits or um, treating people badly, or like even simple things like yelling at people on the road, or like thinking bad things about other people around you, judging them. It's also, it's, it's a condition because it's conditioning your mind to think in that way that is not really the way God would see things or not really the way God would think. And so if we want to fully restore ourselves to become an original, ideal, God-like human being, you have to actually practice that. That's our portion of responsibility. You have to practice being more and more like God every single day. And so to fully restore yourself to God, we call this restoration through indemnity. And so what is indemnity? So indemnity, I don't have the exact definition, of, but indemnity is defined as being able to restore yourself to a proper position. Like you were in a place, and then that position was lost, and you're coming back to the place you originally should have been in. And indemnity comes in different forms. So I like to use this baseball example to explain indemnity because I think it makes a lot of sense. So you're a kid, that kid right there, and you're practicing baseball outside in your yard, and you hit it too hard, foul ball, and it goes through your neighbor's window. It was an accident, you didn't mean to, it's not like you're maliciously doing something, but now their window is broken and you have kind of, you're responsible for it. 
So the neighbor comes out and equal indemnity would be the idea that, okay, you broke my window, so what I ask of you in return is please pay for a window. Makes sense, like you broke it, you fix it, it's very equal. So the thing you did wrong is exactly what you do to pay it back, that's equal indemnity. However, you're a kid and your neighbor is probably full lesser indemnity, where the person that you wronged, or the thing you did wrong, actually allows you to repay a little less. So for example, if your neighbor said, okay, instead of, you know, paying for my window, it's really expensive, you don't have money, I'm going to ask you to mow my lawn for the next month, every week. And if you do that for me, then I'll forgive you, I'll pay for my own window, like it's okay, you're just a kid. Because that person has a sense of forgiveness and a sense of like, okay, that's, that's fine. Like, I'll, I'll let you do less as long as you have this sincere heart of like, I'm so sorry and you don't do it again, obviously. So that would be lesser indemnity. Oftentimes lesser indemnity is what we receive from God because yeah, we mess up all the time. And if we have to exactly repay everything we mess up in our lives, that's a lot. And if we have to exactly repay everything that all of humanity has messed up in our lives, oh my God. <laughs> so oftentimes God forgives and God allows people to just repay a little less or do something to show their heart and show their sincerity that isn't exactly repaying what was lost. But there's also this concept of greater indemnity that oftentimes happens, but it only happens when you don't actually repay what you were asked to do. If you're given the opportunity for lesser indemnity, but you don't do it. So in this example, if the kid, okay, you can mow my lawn for a month and then I'll, I'll forgive you. But the kid decides, I'm not gonna mow your lawn for a month, keeps doing what they're doing and like doesn't help their neighbor at all. The neighbor notices that they see that, okay, well, the kid broke the window. He's still playing baseball in his backyard. He hasn't mowed my lawn. He's not saying sorry. Like, then the neighbor gets mad because it's like nothing has been done to repay the, the wrong that's, that's occurred. And so then the neighbor will call your parents and they'll have your parents pay for the window. Also, you have to mow the lawn. And also, now your parents are mad at you so you're grounded and you can't play baseball anymore. That's a whole lot more indemnity, a lot more repayal than you probably should have had to do but it's because your heart wasn't in the right place, because you didn't apologize, you didn't feel like you actually were repenting and trying to pay back what you did wrong. You're just like, eh, brushed it off. And so this happens a lot of the time in history when someone fails their responsibility. When they're asked to do something and they don't accomplish it, then either they or their descendants have to do more to actually repay that and have to do more to separate themselves from Satan. And so you'll see that throughout the course of history, each central figure has to do more and more than the person before him because something wasn't completed, something wasn't paid back. And that's also why like, the history tends to repeat itself, like Luke said, we go in circles. Because every single time that you don't fulfill something, it has to be done and then more has to be done on top of it. So yeah, this diagram. So throughout the course of the workshop, we're going to be talking about the central figures, which is basically the idea that it's difficult to do something first. It's really difficult to be the first person to like take the step to go above and beyond other people, to do more goodness than other people, to be more godlike than other people. And so God works through sp certain specific people and helps them make that first step. Because then other people, everybody around them, can look to them as an example and will already know the path to take to, to restore themselves back to God. And so every central figure, for example, if the whole world is at like a 1% godliness, we're in hell on earth, and people are just terrible. If there's someone who has 5% like God, or 5% goodness, they're already a step above everybody else. And that person can be looked to as the central figure, as the example that everybody else can follow to become more and more like God. But then once everybody reaches that 5%, there needs to be a new person who is now 10% or 20% more like God. 
And so then everybody looks to them and they help everybody reach 20%. And eventually we make all the way up to the Messiah. The Messiah is the person who is 100% like God, 100% the ideal person that God intended every human being to be like. And the Messiah is a person who everyone should look to to raise themselves up to that standard as well, to actually form a perfect relationship with God, like it should have been in the very beginning, but isn't. And so, yeah, I'm going to talk about the first two, Adam and Noah. And uh, the indemnity conditions, or the different tasks or things that they have to complete to fulfill their portion of responsibility to grow. Because every human being has to take their own step, make their own conditions to bring themselves back to God. So each central figure is asked to do two things. And we call these the foundation of faith and the foundation of substance. When these two things are completed, then that person is prepared and ready. Their heart is prepared and they're internally ready to receive the Messiah or the, the higher person. And so we call these foundation of faith, foundation of substance, the foundation for the Messiah. And so in order for the Messiah to actually come to the earth and to be there showing people how to be 100% like God, people actually have to be prepared for that. They have to be ready for that. They have to want to be 100% like God. It's, you can't just force people to be like God. God is not like that at all. He gives people their own responsibility and their own free will to become like him and to, to grow themselves to that maturity level. And so each central figure shows a course of foundation of faith and foundation of substance. And in each era and each time period, they're different. So that it, it's like a blueprint of what we each have to do to be able to lay our own foundation for the Messiah and lay our own preparedness to actually become the person we're supposed to be. And so the foundation of faith is like your proof that you are, have faith in God, that you believe in God, and you're gonna do what he says. And so it's basically God asks each central figure to do something. And usually that something is not easy. But he asks them to do it. He asks them to do it in a specific way. And to fulfill this proof of faith, this foundation of faith, they just have to do it, accomplish it. And usually that's a very like physical, here it is kind of thing. The other one is the foundation of substance. This is the proof of character. Now this is the difficult one because when put in a difficult situation, when put in a relationship that you're struggling with, you have to prove that you have taken enough steps that you can respond as God would. You can respond as a true person and that you are working on your internal self. You're not just putting on a show of faith but not actually internalizing it. So this foundation of substance is really important and also really difficult because it proves your character as a human being and whether or not you're actually ready to become more and more like God, or become more and more just fulfilling your potential. And so the foundation of faith needs three things. First, the central figure, the person who does it. Second, an object for the condition, which is basically the thing that you have to do, the object or the request from God that you have to fulfill. And third, it needs a time period. Now, a time period is really important because it's easy to show you have faith for like a short amount of time, for like 10, 10 minutes. It's easy to say you have faith. What's a lot harder is continuously having faith over and over again for a long period of time when you're not actually seeing results or you're not actually understanding what it is you're doing and you still have that faith and you still continue working on it. That's what shows you have true faith and your faith is not just one dimensional. It's not just you say it, but you don't actually believe it. And so there needs to be a time period to truly prove that you have that faith and it's real and that it's strong. Then the foundation of substance has to happen, where the central people are put in a position to remove their fallen nature. So basically they're put in a really, really difficult relationship or situation where they are tested, their internal character is tested, and oftentimes it's very similar to that very first situation of the fall, where they go through the same emotions, the same feelings 
that Lucifer himself did and Adam and Eve themselves did in the Garden of Eden. And the point is that they should be able to overcome those situations in the right way. That shows that they are no longer just fallen people, but they're taking those steps to come closer to God. And so oftentimes these conditions depend on the situation. They're very different, and they're very different in each family. I guess I had one last point about that. This foundation of faith and foundation of substance has to occur for everyone, honestly. Each person has to show their own faith. And they have to, they're, they're often put in their own situation, including all of us here, where we have to be a person who can take those steps back to God through our free will, make ourselves more and more reaching our potential or better ourselves more and more. And so when we look at these central figures, don't expect that what happened to them is going to happen to you. Like, you can't learn from them thinking, oh, all right, Cain and Abel had to make a sacrifice. Guess I'm going to go kill a cow now. <laughs> like, we're in a different time period. There's different, there, there's different asks of each person because of the place we're at, because of the time in which we were born, because of the conditions of all the people before us. We're, we're standing on a, like a different plane and we have different asks ourselves. So what you need to look at in each of these figures is not what they did, but their heart and their attitude behind it, and what it is that they were thinking, how it is that they were feeling, and how they overcame each of their situations, because that's what we can learn from in our, our own lives. And so the first central family is right away Adam's family, because God doesn't waste time. He's not just gonna let his his children stew in this hell on earth just to punish them or something. God isn't like that. So right away, God comes to Adam's family as the first family on the earth and tries to help them restore themselves back. And since they're the very first family, they have quite a bit of lesser indemnity to pay. Where the ask of them was to create sacrifices which is kind of a small thing to do for like, you know, destroying your relationship with God for yourself and all of the eternity following that. But because they're the first, they, they have this love of God and he's trying to help them just make these offerings, make these conditions to restore themselves. And so the very first thing that Cain and Abel have to do is offer sacrifices. Now, why is it Cain and Abel? Because you would think, okay, it's Adam's family. He made a mistake, so shouldn't he have to restore himself? Well, nowhere in the Bible does it ever mention Adam doing anything to restore himself back to God. So the divine principle has several theories on like why that is. One of them is the idea that, well, Adam was the very person who broke God's heart. Adam was the very person who committed those sins that like caused the fall. So he is at a place internally where he cannot be the one who can also be a cut above everybody else and be the one restoring people as well. Um, so instead, what happens to Adam is that God separates him into two through his children. So Adam has two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain is the oldest son, and Abel is the youngest son. And what we see happening here is that Cain and Abel each represent one aspect of the fall. If you remember back to when we were talking about the fall, we had the pictures. So there's Lucifer, and then he had a relationship with Eve first. And that was like the first fall, which was spiritual, and Eve's internal state, and the spiritual fall. Then Eve multiplied that and brought Adam into the picture. And then they had their physical fall as well, which caused their lineage to also be fallen. So the spiritual fall was actually a lot worse because it came from this place where Lucifer was jealous, envious, and angry at God and was trying to punish God. And he caused the fall and Eve reciprocated completely and they internally separated themselves from God. The physical fall happened when Eve tried to get back to doing the right thing. 
she realized what she had done wrong. And she tried instead to have this relationship with Adam to like fix it, but she did it in the wrong way. She didn't like ask for God's guidance or help. She just did whatever she thought was right, which ended up messing everything else up. But because she was trying to return to God, she was trying to return to what was originally principled and the relationship she was supposed to have, that fall was slightly better in God's eyes than the first throw. And so when God separates, the oldest son is the representation of that first fall, while the younger son is the representation of the second one. And so Cain goes to Satan's side, where God can't work through Cain. And Cain is the representation of what Satan went through and of Lucifer's fall. God instead works through Abel, who is the second son, the representation of trying to restore better. And so Abel, just because of the, the order he was born in, is already that person who stands a little bit above everyone else. Because the reason of his being is to try to restore himself back to God already. And so it wasn't really anything Cain and Abel did, but because of the order in which they are born, they already represented something. So, story of Cain and Abel, what actually happened? So Cain and Abel are both asked by God to offer sacrifices. And so they work really hard, they try to create this sacrifice. I don't know exactly how they do it, but back in the time period, that was like a thing you did. You take your best, you know, if you're a shepherd, you take your best sheep, you take your, the best part of your flock, and you offer it to God as it's saying like, yeah, all the best goes to God. Um, if, and then I think, I can't remember which one's which, but I think Abel was the one who was a, uh, mm -hmm. Abel was a shepherd, and Cain was working in the fields. Okay, so Cain was working in the fields, he offered his best crops. And yeah, if you think about it, that's actually a big ask from God, because at that time, your crops is your food, and your best crops you would want to, you know, use to making new seeds so that your, your next crop is even better. But instead, you're offering it up to God, saying, like, God is more important even than my own survival. And the same with your best sheep or goats or anything like that. Those sheep or goats probably would be able to reproduce the best, to create a bigger flock, to help you survive longer winters, to have the best wool. But instead, you offer those to God. And so those are the things that are offered by Cain and Abel. The time period, it doesn't exactly mention what the time period was. But if you think about it in context of like what was actually happening, it takes a long time to grow crops. And I can imagine it also takes a long time to like raise really healthy sheep. You put a lot of investment into it. And so that time period where they know that they have to offer their best, They've been investing into these sheep, they've been investing into these crops, putting in a lot of work and effort to make them the best so that those can be offered to God. And so there was a significant time period where Cain and Abel had to keep their faith and keep this intention of like, okay, this best thing that I'm raising is meant to be sacrificed, it's meant for God as well. And then they burnt their offerings. Cain's, nothing happened. Abel's goes up in flames. Therefore, Abel's is accepted by God, and Cain's is rejected. Again, why is Cain's rejected? It's rejected because he is the representation of the first fall. He's, he's on Satan's side, and so God can't interact with him. So really, it's nothing... It's, it's bad luck for Cain, <laughs> really. <laughs> but because he's in the position he's in, and he put in a lot of effort he's in, um, he gets really upset, obviously. The fact that Abel, his younger brother, you know, made an offering, they both made offerings, but how come one of them gets accepted, one of them doesn't? It's not like Cain had the DP that he was reading, oh shoot, I'm on Satan's side, guess I have to just like take it like me. No, he's upset. He sees that, why isn't my offering being offered? Like, I, I did my best, I tried to offer it as best as possible. Why can't God have accepted both? It doesn't make sense. And he gets really, really angry and upset and jealous and resentful. And he has exactly those same feelings that Lucifer had right in the beginning of the garden, where it's like, why does God love Abel more? Why, am I, why, why, why is my effort not loved as much? And what actually ends up happening is that Cain kills his brother. He gets so angry, he gets so worked up, 
that he smacks his brother with a rock and kills him. And so you can see the foundation of faith were those offerings, where they each made the offering, it was accepted. So the foundation of faith worked out. But the foundation of substance was this relationship between Cain and Abel, where Cain was put in a position to feel exactly what Lucifer had felt in the Garden of Eden, and his actual task or goal was to restore that relationship, to actually reverse the course of the fall and pay indemnity for it by feeling those feelings, but overcoming them. So what should have happened? As you can hear, see here, like I said, there's a comparison. Lucifer felt jealous of Adam and Eve, got really angry, tempted Eve, leading to her spiritual death and the spiritual death of basically every other human being that came from Adam and Eve from then on. Cain felt jealous of Abel. <laughs> Typo. He killed Abel, <laughs> leading to his physical... <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I was doing when I was saying this, but... Killed Abel, leading to Abel's physical death. So literally, he just repeated the exact feelings and the exact actions of the fall. So that, that foundation of substance was failed. It, it didn't occur because he didn't actually restore anything. He was put in the same position, he did the same thing. What should Cain have done? So each of these points actually corresponds to a fallen nature that Lucifer experienced, that Lucifer created. First fallen nature is not seeing from God's perspective, right? So what should Cain have done in the position? He should have loved Abel, looked at Abel from God's perspective, Humbled himself down instead of getting angry, like, why is my younger brother better than me? Why is God like my younger brother better? That doesn't make any sense. What's wrong with me? What's better about him? I'm the same as him. Looking at Abel, like, wow, Abel did something right. Like, this is my younger brother. He's a great guy. And wow, I'm happy for him. God accepted him. That kind of feeling. What else should he have done? The second fall in nature is leaving your proper position. So, to reverse that, Cain should have received God's love through Abel. Where basically, instead of leaving his position, he should have actually gone to Abel and understood, since, since in the Garden of Eden, Lucifer was meant to be the teacher of Adam and Eve, but instead he left that position. He stopped teaching them and he started hurting them. What should have happened to re reverse that is that Cain, in the position of Lucifer, should have actually listened to Adam and Eve. And he was supposed to be their teacher, but they were eventually to grow up to become his kind of, like his, I don't want to say masters, but like God's children. And he could have listened to them and united with them too. And so what Cain should have done is receive God's love through Abel, where maybe Abel could have come to him saying, oh, shoot, like, I'm sorry that God didn't, you know, accept your offering. Like, maybe I can help. Maybe I can teach you what I did. And let's see if we can try again and work together and make it better this time. Then the third fallen nature is reversing dominion. It's that arrogance. It's like not listening to other people's advice. What Cain should have done was listen to Abel's advice. If Abel had come to him and helped him and tried to help him to actually succeed and create something, he should have listened to that advice, been humble, and realized that, okay, if he didn't do something, maybe he didn't do something right and he could learn from his younger brother, even if it's his younger brother and he doesn't, you know, have that kind of arrogance to, to think that he's above him. And finally, Multiplying evil is the fourth fall of nature. Instead, they would have to multiply goodness, where Abel could share his goodness to Cain. And he would have learned God's will from Abel, tried again, and really united together to create a beautiful family, a beautiful relationship. Because that's all that God ever wants, is these beautiful relationships with people who love each other, who treat each other well, and who try their best to be good at people. And so if the two brothers had been able to actually unite to create this good relationship and offer another offering together to God, they both would have been accepted. They both would have succeeded in that foundation of substance. And since they completed the offering in that foundation of faith, that would have raised both of their spiritual levels up 
And everybody around them, their family, could have looked to them to understand how it is that you have to um, like, reach out to God, understand God, and what it is that you have to do to form a good relationship like that. Because obviously their parents didn't do that. But instead, that didn't happen. And so, yeah, I guess there's a few lessons. But that didn't happen. And so God had to move on from their family. He had to work through somebody else. So the first lesson we can learn from Cain and Abel is this idea of humility. That there are often going to be people in our lives that are better at us than something. And there are often going to be people in our lives that can teach you. But we have to actually be humble enough to listen, to learn. We have to be humble enough to receive advice. Second, it teaches you how to reverse fallen natures, what should have been done. I just went through them all. That same situation with you and another person between two people happens over and over and over again where someone succeeds in something and you don't, and that anger, that jealousy, that envy comes out. But now you can see very clearly what should happen, the, the humility, the listening and receiving guidance from that other person, and together being able to form a bond of love. The third lesson that we learn is that God will never give up, because, okay, God tries to restore Adam's family, and they fail in their, their foundation. So God can't send the Messiah to them. They're not ready, they're not internally prepared. And now Abel is dead, the person that God has been trying to work through. So it is very plausible to just give up, but God never does give up. And so there's a third brother, Seth. And since we can't choose Cain's lineage, God chooses Seth's lineage and goes through that lineage to continue to try to find people who can be his next central figure, who can try again, and who can try to actually fulfill these foundations of faith and substance. And so the next family comes 10 generations after Adam and Eve. And throughout the whole course of this time, like history is happening, people are multiplying, civilizations are being created, and people suck. Like all of these fallen natures are coming out and multiplying and growing, and there's so much evil going on in the world. And God just has to like sit there and wait and try to find a person who is even five percent better than the rest of them, who is even five percent more godly, more righteous, more good than everybody else that he can work through and actually have this person become the next central figure, become the person who who teaches everybody else what's and so finally, he finds Noah, who is righteous among all the rest of the men, and chooses Noah to be his next central figure. So, once again, Noah has to fulfill a foundation of faith. So, Noah was asked to build the ark. And the ark is actually really interesting. It's a very symbolic creation. So if you look in the Bible, it, it describes exactly how this ark was meant to be built, the dimensions, the levels, and everything like that. But it has three decks, which we can see represent the three stages of growth that every human being has to go through for making growth completion. And then on this ark, he's supposed to bring two of every single animal, he has to bring his family, and he has to bring himself, right? Every single animal that's on this ark is representing, you know, the created world. So through this offering to God, he's also restoring all of the created world. His family, Noah's family, represents humanity, where through his, his, uh, his hard work, his foundation of faith, through his offering, he is restoring his family as well, and he's restoring all of humanity. And Noah himself represents God, where he is in the position to be the one to create this restoration, to be the, the central person, the person who is to teach everybody else, to guide everybody else closer to God. And so finally, the time period is 120 years, where Noah works on this ark, day in and day out for 120 years, which even if people didn't live that long at the time, it's a symbolic number. 
that comes from comes from here. It's this idea of unity and this idea of twelve, where it, it creates the foundation of faith. Um, and for these 120 years, which is basically a long, 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 long time, he is working to build an ark at the top of a mountain, which is like sounds like the stupidest thing you could ever possibly do. And everybody else around him, his society is like laughing at him, is treating him horribly, like he's the outcast of the of the universe. But Abraham is, or not Abraham, Noah is able to hold on to that faith. He believes so hard and so strongly that this is what God asked him to do, even if he doesn't understand it, even if it's really difficult, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it's 120 years and nothing is happening and he's still building an ark. Noah has that faith that is enduring. And he actually completes the ark and he gets everybody onto it. And lo and behold, everything that God said came true. The flood came. Everybody else in the world was wiped out, and Noah's family was the only ones left. And so another numbers interesting thing is, this is the first time where the 40-day judgment period comes about. So 10 is the number of unity with God we talked about. Four represents the four position foundation. And so the number 40 is creating unity from each position of the four position foundation with God, where basically every single part of any relationship is brought back to God. And so this becomes the number of separating yourself from Satan to come closer to God. And it becomes a number that comes up again and again and again, where every person after this has to go through a 40-day period of time. And so this flood judgment happens, everybody else is wiped out, and eventually floodwaters come down, no one has family come out, and they have to start afresh, anew, with, um, and they become almost the first family again, in the same positions as Adam and Eve's family were just uh, 10 generations early. And once again, so now the foundation of faith is set, we have to have the foundation of substance. Noah has already shown his faith with God, but again, he has to be symbolically split through his children. And his children must set the foundation of substance, where they can have this relationship that shows that they have learned from Noah. They have inherited his faith, and they can be people who are more godly, who have this beautiful relationship with God, and can help teach the rest of the people around. So, there are these two sons, Shem and Ham. Shem is the oldest, and so once again, he is on Satan's side just because of his birth order, because of the position. And Ham is on God's side. And so Ham is the person that God tries to work through with first. But Ham didn't actually set this foundation of faith. If you think about Adam's family, Abel, God was working with him, but he did show his faith. He created an offering and it was accepted. Ham did not. So Ham has to show that he has the same faith as his father, that his heart, is really so aligned and is so similar to Noah's that God can accept him as the representative of Noah's faith. But a situation happens a few days after the floodwaters go away and they're, they're trying to create their new society here on the earth all by themselves as the first family. Noah's celebrating, he's happy that finally all this hard work paid off and he drinks some wine, and he like goes to his tent, and he falls asleep with no covers on, but he's naked in his own tent. Not that big a deal, honestly, if you think about it. <laughs> but his son Ham comes into that tent. Ooh. Goes back outside. Oh my god, our dad, like, what the heck is he doing? He's drunk, he's naked, he's asleep. We gotta cover him up, he goes to his brothers. And they take a blanket and they back in with their eyes closed and cover their dad with this blanket. Like, disgusting. <laughs> what kind of unity is that? And so that act right there was actually the point where God could see that Ham was not united with God, or 
with with Noah. And so he didn't have that same faith. He didn't have that respect for Noah and his faith. And he was not ready. we learn from this story is that first looking at Noah we can learn a lot from his heart of absolute faith of his heart of no matter what difficulty you're going through believing that what you're doing is God's work and continuously working on it regardless of if the people around you are scorning you or uh, are mad at you or treating you like trash having that own self um yeah, that self-confidence and that knowledge that you are doing God's will. And that even if you're not seeing results, to keep working at it and to keep doing it. But second, from Ham's story, it teaches us that sin is actually not just the result of your actions, but it's in the state of your heart. Because if you think about it, covering up your dad with a blanket when he's sleeping is not a sin. And if Ham had come in, and he had seen his dad, and he loved his dad, and he had that heart to seek unity with his dad. And he thought, wow, like, Noah had worked for 120 years. Maybe I doubted him at some points, but look, the things he did, it all came true. There's gratitude to him because, you know, you're alive when everybody else just got wiped out. And you saw that everything he had done, all this hard work, was actually for a purpose and a reason, and it helped to save his life. If you looked at your father from God's perspective like that, and you had that respect and unity with him, then maybe, okay, he's sleeping naked. You could leave the tent, he's asleep, leave him alone. Or you could take a blanket and cover him and maybe tuck him in and think, wow, he deserves a rest. That would have shown some sort of artistic unity, some respect for his father, some love. Instead, he runs out, tells all his brothers, oh my God, dad is gross, he's asleep, he's doing all these things, let's cover him up. And then they run back in. This is so, like, I can't even imagine how disrespectful that is. So like, come in, not even want to look at your own dad, cover him up, closing your eyes, like, ugh. Like, you don't even want to see him. Like, everything he did is just nothing. And this person is just disgusting, and like, there is no heart there. There's no love to your parents there at all. And so the same action, covering someone with a blanket, can be done with a state of love, or, or it can cause sin, or it can show your heart. And so everything we do, we have to think about our motivation, and the reason why we're doing it, and the kind of heart we're doing it with. Because any action can be done, and it can have a good per like a it can be done and it causes something good, but if you do it for selfish reasons, then it's not a good action. And any good thing, or any, any bad, yeah, anyway. Whatever you do, you have to look at the state of your heart and understand why you're doing it internally. Because that's what's going to show you as a godly person versus as a selfish person. And third, as always, we learn that God will never give up. Because once again, foundation of faith set, foundation of substance fail. But God continues on, and he keeps trying to find a person through the lineage, throughout the course of history, who can be the person who raises up people to the next level, and who can be the next central figure. And so that is going to be the person we talk about in the next lectures, is Abraham. And yeah, there's a lot to learn from him. But for now, I hope you guys can really just like think about the lessons that you've learned in these lectures, how you can apply them to your lives. And um, yeah. Thank you so much.